Good Sunday morning to you. I'm so glad that you're joining us for our time together today. And uh, how nice is it to have some beautiful weather finally making its way into our region. Uh, we've been enjoying some sunshine. Hope you've had a chance to get out and enjoy some of that. Maybe you have some yard projects you're working on. We learned last week to save the weeds. <laughs> so you may be working on that too. I do want to welcome you. And uh, I just want to remind you, there's ways for us to stay connected even though we're not able to meet in person. Uh, things like Facebook and Instagram, um, our website, which is the letter R for Rochester, calvary.org, rcalvary.org. It's a great way to stay up to date. And also, uh, even in this format, uh, this online format of services, there's a great opportunity for you to actually comment during the service. And uh, sometimes you might even have a question. We have people who are overseeing that and they're happy to respond to. In fact, they're encouraged to hear from you. And so we would just encourage you to do that. We're in a series called uh, The Parables. We're looking at the short stories of Jesus because the stories of Jesus teach us a lot about God and how his kingdom works. And so today we're going to look at the story of secret growth and it's found in Mark's gospel, chapter four beginning in verse 26. And this is what it said. Uh, Jesus also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. And as soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Um, I'd like to ask you a question uh, this morning. If you could choose between having more confidence heading into a problem or having less problems, which would you choose? What would it be like to have more confidence going into a problem? In fact, what would that look like? And more confidence doesn't necessarily mean less problems. It might mean more solutions. So what does confidence look like? Well, for some people, they assume it's kind of commanding attention when you walk into a room. You, you kind of walk in with a, with a presence that requires people to look at you. Or some people uh, think that confidence looks like a person who demands action. They, they know what to do, and they're willing to bark out those orders. But what we have come to understand in Scripture is that confidence often looks like patience. Confidence often looks like patience. That time is actually a tool that God uses, not a thief. This is quite an interesting concept because most of us feel like time is working against us. And this story that Jesus tells reveals to us that God uses time to work on our behalf for our benefit and for his glory. So this story helps us to learn to be patient with ourselves and patient with others. And I think we, both, we all struggle with the idea of, of being patient, and not just with others, but also with ourselves. Here's what the crux of this is about, that God's will is not just an event. God's will is a process. Sometimes we're waiting for something to happen when God is at work in a process, and it's heading in the direction that God wants it to. So this gospel uh, is written uh, by Mark, and he's kind of, I think, giving us some insight on a personal experience. There, is, there may be things in his life where he had to wait, and he had to see how God was working over time. And uh, the temptation, of course, is when we're facing painful things, is to try to get away from them, to escape them. Or sometimes the temptation when we're facing delayed dreams is to give up on them and to head in another direction. And those temptations can be very real. But often, if we yield to those temptations, we can wind up aborting what God wants to do in and through our lives. Now, the question is, who wrote the Gospel of Mark? And there's actually not complete consensus on that. There's some varying opinions. Uh, many Bible scholars believe that the Gospel of Mark was written by Mark the Evangelist. And Mark the Evangelist was... Uh, kind of famous for something he did that he regretted deeply. And uh, he started a, a journey with the Apostle Paul, a missionary journey. And things were going well in the beginning, but things got very difficult. And when they got hard, he abandoned Paul and he abandoned the mission. He just up and left. And the result is, is that became a very 
embarrassing moment in his life, one which he regretted, and quite honestly, one which a lot of people didn't forget about him. We also know if it's this mark that he developed something of a close relationship with Peter. And uh, uh, Peter would understand what it's like to fail in significant moments and to find his way back. And we believe that that's the source of the story that Mark recalls, is that Peter tells him a story. In fact, this is the only gospel that actually records this particular parable. And that's the story of the secret growth. That there was something that that meant very powerfully to Peter, and it wound up being something that meant a lot to Mark. Now, this is a story of how God works in our lives and how God's word becomes visible in our world. How God's word works in our lives and how his word becomes visible in our world. Because every single time we're confronted with God's word and we surrender in obedience to it, it acts like fertilizer to the seed that he has planted inside of us. Let me rephrase that again. Every act of surrender to God acts as fertilizer to the seed that he has implanted in us. Obedience feeds the work of God in us. Now, uh, when we have to wait for things, that can create some powerful emotions, anxiety and doubt. And uh, if, if I were to define anxiety, you know, how does that build in us? I think if we try to do what we want, when we want, with whom we want, and how we want, we're likely to experience a lot of anxiety. But I think if we try to do what God wants, when he wants, with whom he wants, and how he wants, I think that faith begins to take over anxiety and doubt. So while we are waiting, God is actually working. While we are waiting, God is working. God is not waiting too. He's doing something though we don't know how and we don't always see it. It's beneath the surface, but he's doing something significant. It says this in the book of Lamentations, uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 26. It is good to wait quietly. <laughs> it is good to wait quietly. If you have really little children, sometimes they don't wait so quietly. Sometimes really big children don't wait so quietly either. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Learning to wait actually releases some of the most powerful forces in the universe in our behalf. In fact, social scientists actually tell us that one of the most significant things a person can learn is delayed gratification. If you are capable of waiting for a good thing, that it's like there's a force working on your behalf. In fact, they tell us that second to, uh, only to your IQ, it will determine how successful you are in life. God is reliable. You can depend on him. He is at work and he is responsive. He's not just treating us like a, we're a formula or a problem to be solved. It's relational. And so he is dependable. He's reliable and he responds to us. This story also reminds us that God is everywhere. That means where you are. And he knows everything. That means he knows what you are going through. And he can do anything. And that means that whatever it is that you're facing is not beyond his capacity. Knowing this helps us to reduce our worry. Now, there is an alternative to this, and that would be to stop hoping for better things. Just don't get your hopes up. Just take a step back, and, and, and at least you won't be disappointed. And here's what I want you to know. Apathy is a very poor substitute for anxiety. It's not really a better way to live. God doesn't come into our lives and tell us, stop hoping for good things. He just says, trust that I am working while you are waiting for those good things. So I also think it helps us to think through what the source of our desire is. And sometimes we just think all of our desires are created by ourselves. And we certainly live in a culture that's capable of, of uh, creating desire in us. We, we see commercials, uh, all kinds of advertisements, and every kind of media you can imagine trying to entice us to want and pay for something that they're selling. And so it's easy to assume that desires are just something that happen from within or a reaction to some kind of media that we're engaged in. But, but God can give us a desire. 
You know, there's a, a passage that's very often quoted in Scripture. It says that God can give you the desires of your heart. And most people interpret that God can give you what you want. But maybe what it means is God can give you the desire in your heart. Is your desire something that you created or something that God created? And if God put that in your heart, you can trust that he's going to bring that to pass. While you are waiting, he is working. So wisdom from this story shows us um, how God grows things over time. And the first uh, wisdom from the story that we can glean is to learn to act with courage. Learn to act with courage. There are going to be some things you need to do in the process. Maybe some things you need to let go of in the process. Some things you need to take a step of faith in, in the process. And that's going to require some courage on your part. But if God is at work, then that can be the source of our courage. Secondly, we can dare to allow a death process to occur. We can dare to allow a death process to occur. That sometimes when we set out for something, it looks like it's not going to happen or what is happening is going to be stopped. Uh, there's this great passage in John chapter 12 where this is what Jesus says. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. I mean, the one thing we learn from Jesus is death is not final. And even if it seems like something is not going to survive, we our trust and faith in the working of God over time. It's amazing what he can do. Thirdly, don't pull up roots. We get impatient and we just want to pull up. Our assumption is, is that what God wants to do can't happen where I am. And so I, if I just go somewhere else, do something else, then maybe that will fix it. And, and we have to let the root process work. And then lastly, enjoy the harvest when it comes. It's amazing how many times the harvest finally comes and we just move on to the next challenge. We don't get to enjoy. One of the things about harvest is it's a lot of work to bring all of the wheat and the grain in. But it's also something that you can share with others. It's a source of nourishment to our lives and a source of fellowship because we gather around with one another and we enjoy the harvest that has come in. So I have a couple of questions for you today. What do you need to continue to wait for? What do you need to wait for? What do you need to trust today that God is working in? What is he doing right now? You might not see it, but you can trust in that. Maybe you especially because of the season we're in. Maybe some of your forward progress looks like it took a huge step back. Maybe there's some tension that's growing in relationships. Maybe because you can't be with someone or because you're with someone a whole lot. And what I want you to know is that while we wait, God is at work. You can trust him to use time right now to work things not only for his glory, but for your good. So I'd like us to pray together today. Uh, Father, uh, there's all kinds of things that we can be waiting for. We can be waiting for an economic situation to change. We can be waiting for some things to open up in our culture related to this virus. We can be waiting for a physical need to be corrected or to be addressed or to be healed. We can be waiting for a distant relationship to grow close or a closed door to open. We get so, so anxious when we wait. But your son breaks through our worry with this wonderful story that tells us even this small seed planted in the ground, that you are at work and whether we are up and moving even when we are resting, you are working in all of it. We can trust that because we see that in the life of your son. He proves beyond any reasonable doubt that you are for us. And we're so grateful for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, by the way, there's a, a song that we're going to... Uh, go to next. And uh, 
uh, I've, I've really been blessed to have the opportunity, even though we can't be together, to still have an opportunity to talk to you. And I know you can see me, but I, I don't really get to see you. Uh, this week, we were actually able to be able to go into some of your homes and your locations, and you're going to be participating with us in this closing song about the blessing, because while we are waiting, God is working, and he is for us.